Hello, and welcome to the Master of Public Health online program Student Spotlight webinar presented by the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. My name is Kiana Lloyd, and I am an enrollment advisor for the Master of Public Health online program. I'll be your host today. I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Now, before we begin, I'd like to review what you can expect during the presentation. To cut down on background noise, please mute your phone line so as not to disturb the presenters. If you have any questions for our speakers, please type them into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and hit send. You can feel free to enter your questions as you think of them, and we'll answer as many as time allows at the end of the presentation. I want to let you know a copy of this presentation and slideshow uh, will be available in the following weeks. Here's a quick look at what we'll be covering. First, I will share a little bit about the university as well as our program director. Then you will hear from our program director, Dr. Kumar, who will introduce our speakers. Lastly, we will end the presentation with a brief Q&A session. Now, let's begin. The Keck School of Medicine um, was established in 1885. It is the oldest medical school in Southern California. Uh, today, it is a place of dynamic activity and patient care, scientific discovery, medical and bioscience education and community service. Uh, together, we are poised to lead medicine and healthcare in the 21st century for the benefit of mankind. The Department of Preventive Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine is known as a leader in public health and population health sciences. It's organized into six divisions, disease prevention and global health, bioinformatics, biostatistics, cancer epidemiology and genetics, environmental health, and behavior research. Uh, the Department of uh, Preventive Medicine is also ranked number two among the nation's preventive medicine departments receiving NIH funding. Now, our program director, Dr. Shuba Kumar, she's known for her expertise in impact evaluation particularly social return on investment analysis. She has lectured and consulted nationally and internationally. She holds a bachelor in biology, an MPH, and a PhD in healthcare management and policy from the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Kumar has led design and oversight of programs in healthcare, disaster relief, education, and launched an international humanitarian NGO for which she served as COO. Her recent projects include capacity building of healthcare NGOs and development, strengthening of emergency medical systems in Sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Kumar, I wanna thank you for joining us today and I am going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Kiana. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to share with you one of the unique aspects of our online MPH program here at USC, um, which is the ability to travel on faculty-led trips um, as well as other international experiences you would have as a student here. We're going to be hearing directly from three of our fantastic students who have done work in different parts of the world, um, including Africa, Central America, and Southeast Asia. So with no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Ashley Milhouse. Ashley, if you could please share with us a little bit about your work and experience. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Milhouse. Um, I'm a current MPH student with a concentration in global health leadership, uh, graduating this May 2018. And I'm excited today to discuss with you the USC Institute of Global Health trip, one of, one of their offered trips which I attended this past summer in Uganda. So this trip was two weeks to Uganda in the north region in the city of Oyam. And essentially we were teaching a variety of public health sessions to classes of primary and secondary school students. Um, 
So in order to really achieve this, we had numerous partners including the Makareri University Public Health students, which were our co-facilitators. It was really great to meet other MPH students around the world and collaborate with them. Involved in this trip included designing class curriculum, as well as worksheet materials ahead of time, as well as engaging in cultural and tourist excursions and visiting local health clinics and leaders, which I'll get into later. So to give you a little bit of background of where we visited, in Oyem, Uganda, it is a city comprised of fairly rural villages of multifamily units. The city or area is widely known because of um, militarist leader Joseph Kony. He recruited child soldiers and engaged in decades-long civil warfare destroying these communities, uh, which was actually spotlighted by the, by the work of nonprofit Invisible Children. So in this area, the primary language was Longo, and Luganda was spoken in the capital city of Kampala, where we also traveled and also um, flew into. The food there consisted mainly of matoke, or plantains, cassava, meat stews, and fish. And the region was predominantly Christian, but also had um, numerous Muslim as well as indigenous followers. So the first thing in order to make it a sustainable and effective program, we had numerous on-the-ground partners. So first, we had Global Health Network, where our USC MPH alumni student, Evan Pye, worked, and they coordinated with us community leaders in the village health team model to distribute health education and supplies. So this was really great to have a local health-centered NGO to make sure that our program was effective with the schools we partnered with. We also partnered with Yawi, where we worked with talented and energetic Makareri University students who traveled with us and partnered with us as classroom facilitators. And they really made sure that we had culturally relevant materials, as well as that it was linguistically appropriate as possible with all of our accents. And finally, our last partners were Ray United Football Club, which was actually started by USC's Dr. Heather Whitley's son, Ray where we hosted a football camp and a culminating, uh, or soc football, sorry, our term for soccer tournament, which helped gather community morale, as well as participation around these workshops with the school. So there were several components of what we do before the camp, which also depends on whether you're taking this for a practicum or class credit, or you're just traveling for fun. The main aspects of traveling beforehand besides learning about the country was also about designing specific curriculum on a variety of health topics. Below were the health topics that we chose, things such as risky behavior, HIV, STD prevention, leadership, emotional, mental health and resiliency, and communication. We also had a student, Simone St. Clair, who did her practicum on teaching girls how to make sustainable and reusable sanitary napkin pads during their menstrual cycle. She did this focus group to ask about the access to resources girls have, including water, napkins, or towels, or even the stigmatization they face for dealing with their menstrual period at school, including numerous girls who had actually dropped out of school during this conflict. During camp, you can see that we were fairly busy. Um, from around 7 to 8 a.m., we would attend schools where the kids were served breakfast while we would set up for our classroom sessions. And we would teach around four to six classes a day of about 15 to 25 students. Uh, we also had very many dance parties as we brought out a local DJ to help get the kids excited for camp. And in between classes, the kids would also switch off engaging in soccer lessons with our partners football for good. Now, outside of camp, we had wonderful opportunities for traveling in the nearby region. While in the capital of Kampala, we visited an indigenous healing site, the Murchison Waterfalls. We were able to do a safari tour and stay at a safari lodge one night. And we even did a homestay with those village health team leaders and their family units to have a traditional meal and experience life in the mud huts of Oyan. We also visited numerous health leaders and sites, which was really great, um, particularly in my interest of health systems to see how other countries work. We were fortunate to meet with several leaders within the Ministry of Health, 
the Infectious Disease Institute, and Makerere University School of Public Health. We also visited various health centers throughout Uganda, which were from tiers two to four, which in their country essentially range from a small school adjoined clinic to labor delivery hospitals and full surgical centers. We were able to see here their current resource gaps and needs, as well as talk about, um, talk with the staff about challenges that they're facing in the healthcare world. And then we were able to, um, this experience, what it really did was help us as MPH students, particularly those interested in global health. It really gave us a firsthand experience and was a unique opportunity to learn from other diverse cultures. You know, you were really able to apply critical thinking skills when trying to design culturally appropriate curriculum. And of course, you know, that really involved modifying on the ground when we were delivering it to the students to see you know, what was effectively working and what they truly understood and might adapt better to um, better health education as well as behavior change. And it also is really valuable because as an MPH student, it provides the opportunity to see up close the challenges of different healthcare systems and their capacity building efforts. It's also a great experience that you can highlight in your future job resumes or interviews about your experiences abroad. So some words of, words of advice I'd include are really that you have to work hard to prepare in advance um, and also prepare to be very flexible. So if you've traveled to another country, you always know that there are numerous cultural differences at play. So be flexible with your plans and really allow yourself to learn from others. Um, also very important is that food, game, activities, music um, can actually be really important, especially when working with the youth to get them to feel comfortable and very excited for a day of learning and can sometimes help some of those awkward language barriers um, to really help make sure that you're all on the same page and excited together to learn about health. And finally, I just wanted to share some of the MPH coursework, which really helped prepare me for this experience. It was great to see some of these lessons and foundational theories um, applied through this abroad experience. So, some of those classes included the Intro to Global Health class, Health Education and Promotion, Health Service Delivery, Global Health Program Design and Evaluation. And I really would highly recommend um, looking at our special, special topics classes um, because those were two of my favorite classes of the program. Uh, there was a Global Health Leadership Live as well as Global Health Ex Ethics Live with Dr. Shuba Kumar and Dr. Melissa Withers, where we worked with MPH students across different international uh, institutions in North America, um, including Mexico and throughout Asia, to engage with amazing guest speakers. So, um, and finally, if you'd like, there is a great video of our experience um, about this on YouTube, which will be sent via email after the presentation. So. Thank you, everyone, and look forward to your questioning and seeing you at USC. So I'll pass it back to Dr. Kumar. Thanks so much, Ashley, for sharing about your wonderful experience. Um, next, we will hear from Gilmar Flores, who was also in the program and recently graduated. Um, Gilmar, without further ado, I'd like uh, to turn it over to you. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gilmar, and I'm a, I am a recent graduate student from the USC MPH program. Today, I will be sharing my practicum and the faculty led trip experience that took place in Panama in the summer of 2017. Uh, these two pictures, they show the, par the paradox that Panama and many middle-income countries are currently facing. As middle-income countries, they are experiencing you know, sustained growth that is unequally dispersed. On the last picture, you would have seen a complexity of modernity of the country that has gone and gone. It has a city that looks exactly like something you see in Los Angeles or in San Francisco uh, with a good public health system. But as you drive miles away from the city, you face neighborhoods that are underdeveloped or non-communicable and communicable diseases within the population. So course PM599 is a two-week faculty-led trip that focuses in the public health research and practice in Panama. Now, these trips are made possible due to the partnership of the University of Southern Florida 
and Dr. Arlene Cavill, who is an assistant professor for the university and residing in Panama. With their partnership, groups are partnered with the clinic to conduct research and practice their perspective expertise. In the summer of 2017, nine graduate students from USC, including myself, went to Panama to conduct research. With the guidance of Dr. Melissa Weathers and Dr. James Steinberg, we were partnered with the Centro de Salud de las Mañanitas in the community de las Mañanitas. The early class broke down into three small research groups to research vector control, team frequency, and HPV. I joined the vector control group and asked the group we wanted to know where the social cultural barriers in the Juanitas were that were preventing individuals to eliminate mosquito breeding grounds. So we conducted a survey in the clinic and found out that the general knowledge of the vector-borne diseases did not seem to be associated with the years of education and the perceived risk of vector-borne infection had no relation to the actual at-risk levels to the living conditions. In conclusion, it became very apparent that there were not sufficient amount of education about vector control in the community. As a result, our group developed two deliverables, the first uh, which are work posters. The first one would convey the, per the perceived risk of infections from vector-borne diseases and how it could be prevented. The second one conveyed that there is a fine if government officials found any source of mosquito breeding grounds in their homes or businesses' properties. Um, the other slide here, it just showed some pictures of her field trip. Um, on one of the pictures, you can see the field trip to the supermarket where they show us the precautionary measures they would take to ensure that the food were handled according to the government standards. On the other slide, you see some of my colleagues doing the research about HPV. Now, during those two weeks in Panama, the whole group stayed in a hotel in Panama City, and we were driven to the clinic site and other field trips that were planned by the professors each day. Not everything was work. During the weekends, we were able to conduct recreational activities, such as zip lining, going hiking, exploring the city. Some of the students even went to the islands in the Korean side of the country. Also, the hotel where we were given had a small gym and had a pool that most of us enjoy during the weekends and the nights. After the two weeks that PM59 was completed, five students stayed behind to complete the practicums in Panama. We all stayed in Airbnbs in Panama City, and four of us stayed in the same Airbnb to provide just support to one another, in some sense, security as well. For the practicum, a colleague and I were pointed to conduct a practicum in institution called Gorgas Memorial Institute. Gorgas Memorial Institute research institution has been dedicated for more than a investigating the So the last two slides, it's just uh, a few advices that I want to provide to any a current student or any prospective students that consider to do the practice internationally. First of all, uh, you will need to get out, out of your comfort zone. You will not have the luxuries that you have here in the States, and this can be the things can make things very frustrating at times. As an example, um, in the pictures, you see a white tall building, which was the Airbnb where we stayed in. This building looks nice, and yes, it was nice at, nice at times, but the wife in this building, it seemed to suck. At times, I had to, at that time, I had two online classes that had to be completed for the summer semester, and I needed Wi-Fi. There were assignments I could not complete because the videos would not upload or the PDFs would not upload. I was now able to participate in live sessions. I know this seems, seems to be childish, a childish complaint, but it can get, it could get to you, especially if you cannot reach your loved ones if you believe you're going to be Skyping or FaceTyping while abroad. Also, at times, the security guards at the floor level would make it hard for us to get to back to our apartment. We would have to repeat our stories over and over and over to inform them that we were just students staying in the apartment, renting it out. We we're not there to cause any trouble. And we had to wait outside in the humid conditions and before the medicine again. Another advice is to be open minded and be willing to learn. One of my disappointments while I was conducting my practicum is that I was not, I was not able to do outside field work. I chose the tropical medicine as a topic for my practicum, not only to learn from it, but also to gain some actual field experience. Unfortunately, this was not the case. Uh, the entire four weeks I stayed there, I was taken in the office. Um, also, also, my practicum supervisor was not necessarily ready to have me and my colleague there, so at times we felt like we were just staring at each other. Fortunately for us, aside from our practicum assignments, Dr. Suarez thought, thought of some simple, simple things. 
things to consider to be like the tools of war, he utilized the word, meaning the tools that public health specialists use, just like the field, field word, such as softwares like FQ1, Cosmos, GIS. Softwares actually I've never heard of, not even, when, not even during my course as the MPH. So please be open-minded, be willing to learn and grow as a human being while you're in practicum, and it will be rewarding. You'll be able to meet people that will change your life, and you as an individual will grow as well. Well, thank you so much, and uh, now I'll give this back to Dr. Kumar. Thank you so much, Gomar, for sharing about your experience and, uh, and, and your advice as well, and how the courses um, fed into your work and kind of some of your unique experiences. So thank you. Um, so, okay, now we will hear from Annie Pham, who will share about her international experiences. Hello. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Annie Pham. I am in the MPH online program here at Tech. Um, my focus on global health leadership. I chose the online program because my job requires me to travel a lot, and the online program was able to deliver um, quality of education as much as the on-campus program while letting me fulfill my job responsibilities. Uh, with graduation, graduation coming up in May, I look back and reflect on all the opportunities given to me by the program, and I am so glad I chose this. Uh, first, I'd like to share my experience at the 70th World Health Assembly in Geneva. I first heard about it in an email from Keisha, our practicum coordinator. It really was a privilege to attend because my group was chosen from a large number of applicants, all excellent students in my cohort. Um, it is a four-unit class led, led by um, two professors, Dr. Gruskin and Dr. Ferguson. Uh, we are sponsored to be at the assembly by the NCD um, Non-Communicable Diseases Alliance. Our responsibility was to take note in relevant sessions to the alliance and share them with the alliance members. At the same time, um, we were to pick a public health interest of our own and attend relevant sessions about this topic. Uh, my topic was antibiotic resistance and I was able to speak to many individuals working at WHO, as well as other NGOs all across the world. Um, these individuals are all experts on the issue. The professor taught us how to present ourselves and how to strengthen our networking skills, um, particularly on how to speak to very highly respected individuals coming from health ministries all over the world. Um, particularly, we were able to meet um, with our ex, um, HSS um, member, Dr. Tom Price, if you recall. recalled. Um, Personally, I had a chance to meet um, Dr. Margaret Chan, the old um, Director General, and Dr. Tudro, the newly elected General Director of the World Health Organization. Um, Dr. Margaret Chan is my personal hero for years now, and um, out of everything I learned at the assembly, um, her farewell message quoting, behind every number is the person who defines our common humanity and deserve a compassion, especially when suffering or premature death can be prevented. This quote of her continues to serve as a reminder to why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, coming out of the assembly, um, I learned a great deal from networking skills to um, the functioning of organizations such as the World Health Organization, UNICEF, UNDP, <clears throat> And just um, greatly the opportunity to be at this just global stage where you meet these individuals that otherwise you maybe will never will meet. And this obviously was awarded by the um, MPH program every year. You just have to work hard, um, keep your grades up and apply. You have a real good chance to go to Geneva next year. Um, second, um, I would like to um, share with you my experience with Operation Smile where I completed my practicum. Um, I was awarded a research fellowship with Operation Smile from the Institute of Global Health here at USC. Um, being part of the international family study of Operation Smile, I have the opportunity to research here in the U.S. and participate in actual field work in Vietnam and the Philippines. Using what I learned in my epidemiology and biostatistics classes, I was able to help develop and modify a survey that is administered to patients coming to receive cleft lip and cleft palate surgery during all of Operation Smile missions in these countries. Um, as the objective of this study is to explore both epidemiological and genetic causes of cleft, 
um, in the field, I was able to um, collect saliva samples from patients coming in for receive surgery, as well as um, newborn patients at the maternity ward who are considered all controls, who don't have class. Um, everything that I learned here in the program, including biophysic embryology and research and program, helped me become a better research fellow for the, um, the study because I was able to help um, not only with the analysis of our surveys, but also uh, with the development of the program itself because it is an ongoing research. Um, everything we learn from each mission contributes to our new perspective on the study. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, through the fellowship um, with Operation Smile, I was able to learn networking, learn the skill of being an actual public health worker. And um, Operation Smile from then on offered me a full time opportunity on the study. And um, from this full time job, I am now a part of a study with the NIH. Operation Smile, Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and um, University of Southern California um, on a project called Face Base, where we stutter, where, where we study um, further in the facial development process, both genetically and epidemiologically, uh, using 3D picture technology. And the purpose of the study is to create a um, an AI software where we can do what is called a syndrome recognition beyond what um, naked human eyes can do. So these opportunities were given to me all from the program, and all it takes is to, to work hard, learn to network, learn to speak to um, public health workers, and just learn from your cohorts, basically. And um, I am beyond grateful for these opportunities, and um, it's given me a new purpose in life, and I, I after I graduate from the program in 2018, uh, in May, I will pursue my career in medicine, um, carrying with me what I learned from the program um, to be a better position to look at health as a, from a population perspective. And I believe this program has given me an edge as an applicant and in the future, an edge as a physician. Um, thank you for listening, and I look forward to your question. Thank you so much uh, for sharing. We will now try to answer your questions. Uh, to submit a question, please type into the Q&A box. If we don't get to your question today, uh, your enrollment advisor will follow up with you directly. Um, our first question uh, is, when do uh, the trips usually take place? Are they throughout the year or? So I Dr. Kumar, would you like to answer that question? Sure, sure. Um, the, so faculty-led trips typically happen around the summertime. Um, there, the trip to Panama and, uh, and now Costa Rica, which is actually going to happen this year, um, as well as Geneva happen in late May, early June. And then um, to Uganda, our faculty leads a trip typically in August. So most of the time they are in the summertime. Um, we are working on additional options, however, that would be at different points in the year. And they typically last between one to two weeks. Um, so you would spend two weeks in country during the faculty-led portion. And if you choose to do your practicum in country, you would be expected to spend another four to six weeks in country um, actually working at an agency uh, in country where you're working on a specific project um, to do your practicum work. And uh, I'm actually, I'm just going to ask our tech folks in the meantime, while we are doing the Q&A, if you could go back through some of the slides and the pictures that we missed during Ashley and Gilmar's presentation, that would be great to kind of just shuffle through those so folks can get a visual um, as we continue with the Q&A. Great. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. Um, our next question is, uh, are there scholarships available uh, for this program? Um, I can actually answer that uh, for you. 
uh, as the graduate admissions advisor here, you know, we talk to our students about different opportunities that are available. Um, there are scholarship opportunities, not necessarily specifically to the program. However, you can, uh, you know, reach out to the financial aid office who can talk a little bit about some opportunities as well as talk to your enrollment advisor about opportunities that are available through uh, associated groups uh, within the university. Um, our next question is how many people tend to go on the faculty-led uh, trips? Dr. Kumar, so would you like to answer that? Yeah, typically it's a group between about 10 to 20 students. Okay. And it's a Wonderful. combination of our on campus, sorry, Kiana. It's a combination of our online and our on campus MPH students. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Uh, our next question uh, actually is, is how can I join MPH program? So, um, as far as the admissions uh, process here with the University of Southern California, of course, you know, the first step is filling out your online application. Uh, we have enrollment advisors uh, here to assist you through the application process. Uh, we can definitely uh, reach out uh, to you, uh, the students that ask this particular question. Uh, but definitely filling out an online application, uh, the requirements for the program is uh, to provide official copies of all of the transcripts from each college and university that you attended. Uh, you need an updated copy of your resume or CV. It's required to have a statement of purpose, which is two to three pages uh, speaking to, you know, why you're looking to earn this degree, uh, what it will do for your career, and how you plan to contribute positively into the field. Um, one of our other requirements is uh, the GRE, uh, Graduate Level Entrance Exam. We require a combined score of 298, which is 154 in the verbal reasoning segment and 144 in the quantitative reasoning segment. Uh, lastly, we require three letters of recommendation. Uh, the letters of recommendation uh, definitely need to be on official letterhead and have a physical signature. If you've graduated uh, within the last five years, an academic letter of recommendation is required. Um, otherwise, uh, professional letters of recommendation are required. Uh, again, you know, if you have any questions about the enrollment process, an, an enrollment advisor uh, will be reaching out to you uh, to discuss the program as a whole as well as the enrollment process. Um, our next question is regarding the cost of the program. Uh, how much is the MPH program? Uh, the program uh, cost per credit hour is $1,800 per credit, and there are 47 credits required uh, to complete this program. All right, so um, the next question that we have are, well, I guess you kind of answered uh, this question, Dr. Kumar, is do these trips count towards the practicum hours? Um, you said that they, they're more experience-based. Can you elaborate on that question for us, Dr. Kumar? Sure, so they don't currently count towards the practicum hours. So each student is required to complete a 300-hour practicum. Um, this would be kind of a first uh, kind of foot in the country and, and getting a lay of the land. Um, students could take this just as a course, go for the two-week period and just do the, you know, in, in the course format and um, come back. They don't have to stay in country. They could do a practicum elsewhere, but if you do want to do a practicum in country, you do have to put in an additional 300 hours uh, beyond the trip. Also, I want to address, I see another question that came from a couple of students about the, the difference between, you know, being in the online program versus an on-campus program, and if uh, it seems like the online program is as kind of competitive or rigorous, um, given that we have Ashley Milhouse on the line, I would love her to speak to this because she actually was an on-campus student who transferred to the online program, and she'd probably be the best person to kind of give you uh, 
you know, the kind of pros and cons of her experience and how she's handled the transition, particularly given her uh, work responsibilities, et cetera. Great. Thanks, Dr. Kumar. Um, as Dr. Kumar mentioned, I um, have done both experiences. Um, and honestly, I think it really is just the type of learning that best suits you that you may prefer. And it really is a function of effective study habits. So in the online um, curriculum, you know, you do have live webinar classes um, with, with some of your professors and discussion portals and pages for you to upload assignments as well as talk with your peers. Um, but I know for some people the accountability of being in class is something that they prefer. For me, because as Annie, uh, similar to Annie's experience, because my uh, working job required a lot of travel, I preferred the um, more evening hours um, of evening classes that was offered at the online program. But as far as rigor, I think they're both um, completely similar. Um, you know, it is rigorous, but I think that it's definitely manageable, and I think that your professors are willing to help you, which makes it all great, so. Thanks, Ashley, and I'll just add to that. You pretty much have the same faculty who teach on campus and who teach online. Um, so you're taking classes with the same faculty, the same classes. It's just a matter of kind of what medium is, is better suited for you, and I will say that about 95 to 99% of students in the online program are currently working professionals. So it certainly is uh, more conducive to somebody who's already working. Okay, I, we have another question. I'm going to skip this one. Um, it's related to the same. What is the hardest part of doing your master's online versus taking it at the university? Well, I guess Ashley kind of kind of spoke to this in terms of the accountability um, for being in the classroom. Some students find it easier to be accountable, get their deliverables done. If they're in a classroom, they're facing a professor uh, versus, you know, um, being able to be online and then, you know, you don't have to be as accountable, but certainly your grades will suffer. So I think it's really about self-discipline as an online student. Um, if it allows you great flexibility, but it also requires a lot of self-discipline. Other than that, I mean, we have the same entry requirements, the same curriculum requirements, um, same courses, same rigor. So they're really pretty equal. Um, it's just, again, as, as Ashley mentioned, it's kind of really just about what format suits you better. Um, let's see. One more question. So... How long, on average, does it take a person to complete the 47 credits? Typically, students complete the program in two years. So that means um, two courses a semester for over six semesters, excuse me, over the course of six semesters. Uh, if you are interested in being a part-time student, that's an option as well. Um, and that kind of ranges anywhere between two to five years. Um, but most students finish in two years. And as far as the practicum experience, you know, our students, typically they're working in their job, they're doing school, and then they also do the practicum on the side um, during their last couple semesters. And we're pretty flexible about when the start date of that can be, you know, as suited to the student's experience, depending on where they're going to be completing their practicum, whether it's at their place of work or they're going to be going to another country or just working at another agency in their city. Um, there's all kinds of advice and guidelines around that which we're happy to share. It's, it's really up to the student to pick what they want to do. Ideally, you want to use your practicum as a stepping stone to where you want to land your next job or to build experience as far as where you want to land your next job. And so um, it's wise to think about where you would want that to be and really get your foot in the door through this you know, required practicum experience. A lot of students, as Annie mentioned, do end up uh, getting their full-time jobs after doing their practicum. So, it's really a good opportunity to get your foot in the door and build some experience, get to know people, to network, uh, before you progress on to your degree. Another question, do you have to finish all courses before you embark on the practicum? No, you do not. It's a great question. Um, we realize that our students are working and, uh, and side by side, they can start their practicum hours while they're enrolled in their last couple of courses. So it does not delay your graduation. 
However, if you choose to you know, focus on your practicum entirely during one semester, you're welcome to do that as well. Other questions? We have a question, how competitive is the program for entry? Do students from certain colleges or universities have priorities or, or preference? Uh, the entry requirements are listed on our um, brochure and application materials, and um, our enrollment advisors could share those with you further. It's, it is a competitive program. Uh, we are USC. We do, uh, we're accredited by the Council of Education for Public Health, um, as well as WASC, and you know, we're, we're one of the top public health programs out there. So it certainly is competitive, but we also look at the whole student. So in an application, we not only look at your GPA or GRE scores, we also look at your work experience, we look at your personal statement, we look at your letters of recommendation, and really why you're interested in the program, what you seek to gain out of it, and if we think there's a good fit. So the you know the, the entry requirements are, are pretty fair. Um, they're the same as our on-campus program. And I think a lot of students really find value in this program once, you know, once they've completed it. Uh, we hear good things from our students and our alums about having chosen an online program versus an on-campus where they weren't necessarily sure if they would be able to make it or keep it up while doing it on, uh, excuse me, while carrying out their work duties. Um, so far, our students have had really good feedback and uh, the program is going quite well. So we welcome you to apply. Um, and if you have more questions, I would encourage you to reach out to one of the enrollment advisors. So a common question that I see that's coming up is, how do you handle your work balance along with um, your, your school duties? If Maybe if each of you want to speak to that, Annie, we could start with you. Um, yeah, so work. I mean, it is difficult working full time and sometimes, you know, a work extended into the weekend, but the classes online are scheduled so that you have the entire weekend to work on your assignments and the assignments are either due on Monday or Tuesday. So, and live sessions are always at night after five or six at the latest. So, I mean, we, you know, typically finish work by then. So it, it doesn't interfere with our work schedule. But, um, I mean, is it cliche to say just, you just have to manage your time, just kind of go out less? It is a rigorous master program, so um, but it is totally doable. Um, with forty hours or fifty hours, or you can I I can do it. So I believe if you just put your time in over the weekend, you can finish all the assignments. Uh, that's true. Uh, this is Gilmore speaking. And um, at the time when I was doing my MPH program, actually I was doing the MPH program online as a full time student, and I was working full time as well, and so. Uh, the live sessions were on in the afternoon and the evenings, which were very accommodating for my schedule. And to be honest, it's just in regards to how do you time manage, because I was able to complete most of my assignments on Saturday, and I had Sunday's afternoons free and available for, you know, just for pleasure, for, for a walk, for a reading, just like that. So you just have to time manage properly well in order to do both things if you're juggling, if you're actually doing full-time uh, work as well. And this is Ashley, I just would conclude with saying it, you know, it's really important that you set aside time for your, um, not only your live session, your classes, but also your assignments. So carving out specific days or even weekends where you're going to start working on that paper and carving away. What's great that the online program is actually laid out in different weeks. So you can be able to see, along with the syllabus, your future assignments so that you're able to really work ahead and plan ahead. If you have a big proposal at work or conference to go to, you can make sure to do that reading or assignment ahead of time. So, um, and I'd agree with Annie and Gilmar that the live sessions being at night really allows you to be um, a working professional during the day, which is great. Thanks so much, folks. Um, just for those of you who aren't familiar with live sessions, basically the way the online classes are set up is that you have access to the course lectures, the readings, the assignments, all in the learning management system. And then about once a week or once every other week, 
you will meet with your professor and other classmates in a live video conference session. And that, again, as the students mentioned, is typically in the evenings. Um, it's held after typical work hours, so you know, uh, it's a chance to engage in kind of real time with your professors and fellow students. Um, and that is really one of the highlights of our program here at USC because we want to make sure that students have a chance to interact with the faculty and with each other um, versus just kind of being lost in cyberspace. So those interaction times are really critical. That's where you're going to really get the most value um, as being an online student because you get the flexibility of learning directly from your professor and classmates, but you also um, don't have to be, you know, uh, in a classroom in a specific location at a specific time. So, and by the way, those live sessions are also recorded. For every once in a while, if a student can't make it, you can always access the recording and view those. Um, but typically, that's kind of what your week would look like, is you would access the pre-recorded lectures, the readings, um, any kind of quizzes or exams or assignments, and then once a week or once every other week, you would participate in a live session, as well as group projects. We encourage a lot of group projects in our classes, and that really gives you a chance to work with your fellow classmates and network and get to, get to know students all across the country. Um, and, and we have a few international students as well. So that's something that we found that our students really like, and it works well um, to really kind of build your, your teamwork skills, uh, which you're going to be practicing a lot in the public health space. I see another question about um, someone who's interested in health communication. So we do offer a class in health communication, the PM 526. Um, we don't have a track in health communication, but we offer a course. And I, you know, I wouldn't be able to speak to the specifics of what's taught in that specific course, um, but you know, if you're particularly interested, I could connect you with the faculty on that class um, to answer more of those questions. Another question, would it say online on the transcript? No, so your degree will just say a Master of Public Health. It does not specify whether the degree was earned online or on campus. The same degree is accredited by the same uh, institutions, you know, it's seen as the same within the university. It's literally just a different format of, uh, of completing your education. We got a question from Brenda. So I know that USC offers an MPH MSSE dual degree. Can this be done with the online MPH? At this time, we do not offer any dual degrees with the online MPH. So you're correct, we do have those options on campus, but we do not have the dual degree option available online. Uh, another question is, is it mandatory to go on these trips if you're not necessarily interested in global health? It is not mandatory. Um, even if you are a global health student, it's not mandatory. These are really meant to be an option for students who are interested, whether you're a global health student, you're a health education student, you're a biostatistics epi student, et cetera. These trips are open to students from any track, and it's really out of interest. Um, I highly encourage it if it's something that you can manage to do, if you can get away for two weeks. Um, students have really enjoyed them and gotten a lot of value out of them. I mean, when else do you get a chance to go to the World Health Assembly in Geneva and, and kind of witness all the key decisions being made in global health? It's a pretty fantastic opportunity, uh, as well as you know, going to Panama or going to Uganda and working with communities directly. It's a nice way to get some experience on the ground, particularly if you don't already have any, um, to learn what it would be like working in different communities and kind of witnessing how global health plays out in the workspace. Another question from Myla, are the live sessions mandatory? Asking because I travel outside of the country 24 to 30 weeks of the year, so it's odd or I'd, I'd miss a few. Uh, in some classes they're mandatory, in others, they're not. However, if you know you're really not in a position to attend most live sessions, honestly, this is not a, a strong choice for you because the live sessions are where you're going to get the most value and really be able to ask your professors questions, you know, debate hot topics, etc. So if you're going to join the program, it's in your best interest to be available for the live sessions. Um, if you miss you know, a few here or there, that's not a big deal. It happens all the time. But if you really know that it's just not going to work for your schedule, I wouldn't advise it at this time. And if there's particular semesters where you know, you know you're going to be overseas quite a bit, or you know, let's say for our students who are um, in the military, if they know that they won't have access to the internet in a way that they need, 
you are allowed to take a leave of absence for a particular semester, um, and that is always an option. But in general, you want to be able to sign up for, um, you know, for, for about two years of being able to attend live sessions. All right, so I see there's a few more questions, folks, but I know that we're over time. So I would like to thank everybody for joining. And for the folks who still have questions, please do reach out to your enrollment advisors. Um, uh, Aaron, if you could please pull up the contact information slide for folks who have any questions, if you could please reach out. And uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer your questions further. But thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate everybody's patience, your interest. And thank you all to the students, particularly Girmar, Annie, and uh, Ashley for sharing your experiences. And thank you again, Dr. Kumar, for um, your assistance in this webinar. Uh, again, thank you very much to our students, Ashley, Annie, and Gilmar, for sharing your experiences, and to everyone who participated today. As Dr. Kumar stated, if you have any additional questions, or if you think it's time to apply, please reach out to either myself or one of our other advisors. Again, that our contact information is on the screen. I do want to let you know a copy of this recording, along with the slide presentation, will be available uh, soon. Our, the enrollment advisors will get that sent out to you. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you again for participating, and have a wonderful rest of the day.